over here. Yeah. Yeah. Keep us all um, 
on, on time and get everybody a chance to have equal time in speaking as well as cover as much material as possible um, this evening. Each candidate will speak in turn. Um, order will be alphabetical by last name. That means we start with John Bush, Lee Hager Smith, Paul Lancaster, Michael Sutkin. Um, and for each successive question, we will go to the next in line as you are familiar with. Uh, candidates will then be asked uh, the same six questions after the, the first introduction. And it will be from a list that we sent out last week to them. This list of questions uh, is in six, uh, in eight topical categories. We, we select six questions out of those that seem to move across all the different themes. Let's we'll see how well they can bring together the strands and pieces of those, those responses. Um, the candidate responses will be largely limited to two and a half minutes, except a couple questions that we're going to get them a little bit longer to work on. Um, at the end, there'll be a two minute um, summary session where they can uh, clarify any of their points, uh, respond to anyone, uh, uh, and just provide a general closing statement. Okay, there are five candidates running for um, town council. Um, before I begin, I'd like to convey the apologies of Mel Hoover uh, to those of you who may have looked forward to hearing his views. Um, after tentatively agreeing to participate over the phone, he declined our formal invitation, uh, citing concern for, about a hearing impediment. Um, we offered to make some accommodations for him uh, so that he could participate. However, he decided that it was preferable not to join us this evening. Uh, he will be getting hearing aids soon um, and be ready and up and running uh, shortly thereafter. He has provided us with a written document and we will post that on our website and ask him to respond to the same set of questions that the, the candidates were responding to this evening. Um, okay, let's begin um, by taking two minutes uh, to introduce yourselves. We'd like each of you to tell the audience what inspires you to serve what your qualifications are, and what you'd like to accomplish while in office. John? My name is John Bush. Um, I've lived in Blacksburg for 27 years with my family. My wife and I moved in 1984. I uh, worked construction for a number of years, and then went to architecture school as a master's candidate. Um, I've served as the chair of the Historic Design Review Board since the late 90s when it was formed until last year when I came off of it. I won election in 2009 for a two-year term. I'm back up now for re-election, uh, hopefully a four-year term. Um, I'm crazy about this town. It's been good to me and my family. Uh, that's largely what inspires me to serve. I think I can make a difference. I think my uh, experience as an architect and as a planner is vital for local and small town government issues. Um, in my professional work, I serve as an architect for the university. I work for the for the planning department, which helps plan the major new buildings. And so there's a big link between Virginia Tech and Blacksburg, and hopefully we'll discuss some of those issues tonight. Um, I'm uh, very fortunate for uh, being in this town, and my main issues are neighborhood, neighborhood integrity, quality of life issues, and to help us grow in a moderate, sustainable way in the future and to make sure that how we do that is how the folks in this community want to see that happen. Um, I'm passionate about listening to my neighbors and my friends and my colleagues. I'm also passionate about the downtown Blacksburg identity and the folks that have businesses there. And I want to make sure that they continue to be able to thrive. And I think that we'll talk about those issues as well later on tonight. I don't have any major plans for this year except to get reelected, and I'm counting on all of your support. And I look forward to talking with each of you individually at your leisure. Thank you. Thank you, um, Leslie. Um, that makes a nice segue. Uh, maybe my major goal is also to get reelected, and uh, it and it's pretty satisfying to feel that level of calm about things. But I do think it's a reflection of. Um, a council that uh, presently in place that works very, very well together, collegial, collegial with shared goals, and um, I, I, it's very satisfying to be working with this group of people and with our very, very uh, highly accomplished professional staff. So we're in a good place right now. Um, a little personal background. Um, 
My name is Leslie Hager Smith, and uh, I am married with three just about grown children. I'm a, and a grandma. I'm a grandma. Um, we came here in 1982, uh, and my husband joined the statistics department at that time. He's uh, he is department head of statistics at this point at Virginia Tech. Um, I have. Uh, had a career as a uh, civic and school and church volunteer in town. I founded an epilepsy parents uh, support group when uh, my children were quite young. I later joined the Montgomery County Public Schools Special Education uh, Advisory Board. I have worked, uh, been in association with Grown Up Times for six years as a columnist, a stringer, and a uh, staff writer. I was director of community programs at the YMCA of Virginia Tech and also the director of the Downtown Merchants of Blacksburg. So I would say that the, um, the special interest that I bring to town council is in community and in economic development. Um, I think the personal qualities that make me well suited uh, are that I do have a wish, possibly a need to serve. I'm discerning in my judgments. I see a lot of shades of gray. Um, but in the end, I make to make decisions and move on, and I don't take any of it personally. You need to have a pretty thick skin to do this, and I think I manage it. So um, I hope you'll consider voting for me, and I have a website where you can get more information, lesliebakersmith.com. Bob? Well, good evening. I want to thank you all for coming, and also thanks to Citizens First for sponsoring this forum. I've appreciated its involvement in town affairs since before first took office in 2004. And besides that four-year term in town council, I have also served on the town planning commission for 10 years, and I am now involved in my third comprehensive plan review. That's more than anyone else in town. The town plan, of course, forms the basis for most of the decisions made by town council. I've also done volunteer work for the Y, the Free Clinic, and the United Way. I survived a serious health care in 2009. My doctors were not optimistic about my odds. But while I've had to retire from my full-time job, the illness has left me, like Leslie, with a need for public service. I've served on council before, and I'd like to again. As it turns out, issues we took up when I was on council, 2004 to 2008, are coming to fruition now. The North Main Street Project and the Gibbons Progress Street Extension Project were both approved during my term. I also served as council liaison to the Friends of the Farmers Market as we developed plans for what has turned out to be a cornerstone of downtown. I started the movement for a dog park. We now have one, and we now need another. I was also on the winning side of the 4-3 vote to move Bill Brown Stadium from the old middle school to its present location. Where would we be in redeveloping the old middle school property and in building a new high school if that vote had gone the other way? I'd like to continue the progress we foresaw during my first term of office, including proper development of the old middle school and Patrick Henry High School properties substantially completing the pedestrian bikeway master plan and some of the other issues that we'll discuss tonight. Uh, again, my thanks to Citizens First for giving me and the other candidates this opportunity. Michael? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank each of you for coming out tonight um, and taking time out of your business ske busy schedules to attend tonight's forum. I'd also like to thank Citizens First for giving Black Street voters this opportunity to write about the candidates and the issues. This November, each of you will pick our leaders on the Blacksburg Town Council it's the hard work of civic groups like Citizens First to make sure voters know what we, the candidates, uh, stand on the issues before Election Day. Um, I've lived in Blacksburg and called it my home for the past nine years. I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee and raised outside of Asheville, North Carolina and Blainsburg, Virginia. In 2002, I came to town to attend uh, Virginia Tech. During my college years, I served as news editor and a reporter for the Collegiate Times where I uh, wrote about, among other things, local government and I served as a student leader. I graduated with a degree in communication in 2006 and got a job as a writer for my alma mater that summer. For the past five years, I've worked for the university and recently I accepted a position as public relations coordinator for the veterinary college on campus. I'm running for Blacksburg Town Council for many reasons, reasons you'll hear about tonight and in the weeks ahead. I believe that economic development, regional cooperation, smart growth, and strong neighborhoods are critical to our future, and I offer a unique voice on each of these issues. The voice of an active member of our community who has experienced life in Blacksburg as a college student and as a young professional, and who will make sure everyone has a seat at the table. Whether investing my time in town committees and a nonprofit board, visiting the Dominican Republic to help at a home for Haitian street kids, running in a 5K to support a local crisis hotline, or getting dumped for charity and stepping out, 
I've served my neighbors in the New River Valley and elsewhere on many occasions. I view my entry into local politics as a continuation of my commitment to service, and in less than two months, you will decide whether I serve on the Blacksburg Town Council. I would appreciate your vote and your support, and I look forward to a lively discussion of the issues. Thank you. Uh, now we can uh, begin the questions. I'd like to remind you that as you respond to these questions, our primary concerns are good governance, transparency, and accountability. Please provide concrete actions that can be taken with respect to each of the issues discussed this evening. Um, okay, question number one, we'd like to take uh, four minutes in your response on this one. Um, it's been a, a, a hot issue over the, the past few years and months. Even. There are a number of properties in Blacksburg, the old Blacksburg Middle and High Schools, and the new high school, for which town and county are involved in collaborative planning for development. The two questions are, what is your vision for these properties and the town's relationship with the county in their development management? And how would you use the current or an alternative planning and development process to achieve your vision? Leslie, could you start? Yes, and this is with regard to middle school property or all the properties that we share with the county. So that so this is a survey of all the possibilities for all the properties in town. It's about how to do it. Okay. Um, well, okay, let's tick them off. The the uh, I don't mean tick them off like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Um, the old Blackford Middle School property. I I uh, there was a lot of. Um, coaching from the stands, you know, when this was taking place. Um, but I want to say about that process that, um, you know, uh, when Paul was involved in town council, there was a vote uh, and there was some agreement among, among the entities that there would be a competition that was halted. Uh, I think it was probably in 2008. And um, in any event, there was not a clear cut way forward uh, as we began to get re-involved with developing that property. I think what was done very, very artfully uh, with initiative by town staff and also some members of council uh, was to do this delicate dance. After all, we don't own the property. And, and the county themselves, uh, who do operate or uh, nominally operate always with the best interest of everyone, could go uh, forward at any pace they wish and sell that property to anybody they wanted to. And so um, it was no small task to bring all parties to the table and find a way forward. Uh, so the, just the fact that the old middle school plan was made, that may seem like a no-brainer to some people. It was difficult to get everybody to agree to that, and the result that we got was a good one. Um, so that's probably as much as needs to be said about the old middle school. Um, uh, thankfully, it, uh, sanity range and um, all parties understood eventually that the Blacksburg High School could not be resurrected. And it's not simply a matter of money. It was, it was a problem to begin with. It was an old kind of building style. It was a sick building the whole time it was operating and there, there was really, I thought, no merit to the idea of bringing that building back. Um, I, I personally do not think that it serves communities well to have every child in town warehoused in one location, and save for a few elementary schools that are left now. Um, I, it, you know, it, it's sort of Monday morning quarterbacking, but if I had been involved in that vote, I would not wish to have had all the, the middle school, one, you know, one middle school instead of two, uh, a huge high school, and uh, an elementary school all uh, placed on Crisis Fork Road. Nonetheless, uh, that's water under the bridge. We move on, and uh, it is a good thing at this point. It's at least uh, expeditious uh, that we have that property there, plenty of property, more than we need, and that we can move on and get the um, the plan there. Um, I had a conversation. I had conversations all day on Monday with Joe Ivers, with um, Dan Baronado, uh, with parent um, representatives from Build BHS also from the parent, with the parent representative to that planning process with the architect uh, for BHS. 
And uh, at the end of the day on Tuesday, that resulted in Dan Farinato and Brenda Blackburn coming to council to uh, give a report and good support for members of uh, the school board. Thank you, Phyllis and Joe, our big here. Um, and uh, what we learned at that time was that the plans right now are only 35% designed. It's, it is, they are moving swiftly to get this done. And to tell you how swiftly, it's only 35% done now. It's supposed to be finished in only a month, the design work for it. And we approved a CUP so that the site work could take place as they're still designing the school. So you have a group of people who are working really hard now uh, and doing so collaboratively and respectfully for, for a shared goal. I, I think that's a positive. Thank you. Well, uh, my involvement in the middle school property uh, actually started during the last comprehensive plan update. Uh, we came up with the idea of creating these bubbles on certain properties that would invite mixed use development. And uh, I think that helped spur the, the thinking towards looking towards mixed use for that property once it would come up for, uh, for sale by the county. My next involvement uh, was with the old Blacksburg Middle School uh, Committee, which was a combination of uh, the town manager, uh, myself, and a citizen representative from the town, and uh, the same deal from the county, a supervisor, the uh, administrator, and a citizen. Um, first of all, it took the county a year to appoint somebody to do that. Uh, when we came up with the initial idea of doing the design competition, it took uh, them another three months to okay that. Um, then we finally got down to talking about it and got to working on the design uh, process. And then uh, we got to the point where uh, we we're trying to get some details figured out and all that. And, uh, and the county revealed that it hadn't actually gotten the property from the school board yet, which made negotiating about the actual property and what's going to happen to it a little bit of a moot point. So we uh, adjourned with uh, uh, waiting for them to do that, and then uh, uh, by the time I was off council and, and things just apparently fell apart. There. Um, I do think that, again, had we not done the vote that we made during the uh, during when I was on council, uh, if the stadium was still being used there, I think we'd have a lot more problems uh, dealing with that property than we do now. Um, and also with uh, getting the new, new high school built, Trying to figure out what to call it, Patrick County School. Is it the old school? Is it the dead school? Is it the, whatever. Um, as for that property, I think the less done, the better at this point. Uh, it is in an R4 area, right in the middle of the neighborhood. Uh, there are parking issues, obviously, that have been there for a long time. I think uh, we should look at uh, the, uh, for example, Parks and Rec is coming up with its own idea about a multi-generational, multi-purpose recreation center, uh, which would be a possibility for that site along with ball fields and that sort of thing. Um, although I would prefer another uh, cent rec center uh, on the south side of town. Uh, but that's one possibility. I don't see any high grade development there because uh, it's just not the right place for it. I do want to say that um, whatever we do with the new high school, I think, uh, I think the involvement of the town has been as much as it can be so far. It's been a fast process, we've got things going, but we do have a chance now, I think, to make some comments about what, what we'd like to see. I think some green uh, uh, infrastructure within it, whether it be uh, solar or maybe even a wind experiment uh, or possibly geothermal or some sort of green that would be a possibility there. I think that uh, I'm worried about the size of the parking lot that was raised by uh, Mr. Grisalvo at the uh, uh, Planning Commission and Council meeting uh, the past two weeks. And if they don't put in enough parking in the first place, the cars are going to start parking uh, in, in Heathwood and Struble's Mill, and there's going to be a mess with the neighbors just like there is now with the current former high school, or whatever it is. <laughs> um, 1,400 student high school uh, makes me worry a little about, a bit about when the trailers will be coming in. I'd like to see them planned for a little more than that, and I'm about out of time, so I'd like to say that we need to get our, our voice in as, as 
in the next few weeks as this 35 percent becomes 100 percent. Michael, when I first came to uh, Blacksburg, the old Blacksburg Middle School property, it was um, just then starting to um, where it had essentially been abandoned. The school board did not have a plan for what they were going to do with it, and um, there was a hang-up between the, the town of Blacksburg, which controlled the zoning for it, the county, which uh, controlled the property, and the school board that initially makes the decision to join it in. When I say that, I don't mean that it was the town of Blacksburg's fault that the county owned um, the property, but for most of my time since I've been in uh, Blacksburg, the old Blacksburg Middle School property, was abandoned, it was in mothballs. I'm sure many of you have seen the video um, where the, uh, the, there were problems with the roof, the house the building was left for so long and not maintained, but it didn't um, do very well. Um, I think that that's an example of where local governments need to have a plan for what they're going to do um, about uh, properties uh, that are left to change uses in our town. And um, it makes it very pertinent of why we're talking about this question. Today. In terms of the Old Blackstone Middle School property now and the Old Blackstone School Master Plan, I think it is something that I definitely um, support. I've read through the plan. I'm glad it includes um, mixed-use um, development. I'm very excited that Medea um, um, is uh, not only um, expanding but also offering new jobs um, in our community. Economic development is one of the major things that I'm going to be talking about a lot in this campaign, and I think that. Um, the Old Black Supreme School Master Plan, which includes um, um, ideas like an example of how the town can work together on um, these sorts of issues. Um, uh, I, I'm also glad that the Master Plan includes uh, residential space. I currently serve, uh, recently was appointed to the Council and Community Development Advisory Board, and we've been having discussions about um, including affordable and workforce housing on the um, property and, and how to deal with certain issues like parking and infrastructure types of things. So, so there are some um, questions still on the property that need to be um, answered, but I'm glad that we're, we are moving forward on it um, and that we're able to work together um, between the county and the town. For, for too long, um, the county and the town did, did not move forward on this. I'm glad that I hope that we'll be able to pick up the momentum and um, um, move forward. In terms of the, and I'll just tick off the things just like um, Leslie did in terms of the old uh, high school property. We don't want Blacksburg to be known as a place where we have abandoned school buildings. That's not what we want to um, be known for. So I hope that we're able to take this momentum and move forward and work collaboratively to find um, out what to do with it. I agree with Paul that I don't think that we can we can do too much development. We can't have like um, so certainly there are there are neighborhoods in that area. Um, it's not a place for much kind of commercial development, but it is a place for um, res possible residential development, possible recreational development. Um, um, so I hope that we're able to move forward on those um, types of things. Um, at regional cooperation is one of the other things that um, I'm also, in addition to economic development, going to be talking a lot about uh, in this campaign. And um, I, I think that these properties in the county and the town working together is kind of a good example of um, yeah, the types of issues that we need to be working on as a community. Okay, John? Uh, yes, I want to cover um, three specific issues on this question. I want to talk about the Old Blackburn Middle School and its development, Old Blackburn High School, what we can do with that property there, and then what's happening with the new high school property. The Old Blackburn Middle School. The county owned the property, we didn't. We controlled the zoning. It was our floor, which is residential. They wanted it to be commercial. We weren't going to rezone it commercial. We were able to convince them, I think, um, and work with them, especially with the uh, current chair, and, and get them to understand that mixed use was the best, a better use for that property. Uh, we developed a master plan in concert with them and with our design team that the town hired, um, and we listened to a lot of neighborhood input, different charrettes and different activities, and come up with what I think is a very good concept plan for how that uh, 19 acres can be developed as a linchpin to the southern entry to a downtown. It's critical that we protect the neighborhoods. The devil's going to be in the details. The devil's going to be in how the owners of the property come to us and say they want to develop that property. And the design of the roads, the parks, the details of curb and guttering and lamps and benches and all of that is going to be critical. But we'll work on that and we'll get that right. Um, I, I do think it's a good plan. I think we've done a good job on that. 
uh, the old Blacksburg High School. It, it's a travesty that we have these old buildings that get torn down and torn into dust. Uh, unfortunately, the county does not have a very good record on that. I can't support the rehabilitation of that facility, even though I like rehabilitating old buildings. M what my view is, and I think most, most folks that live around that neighborhood, is that area is zoned R42. We want to expand the rec facilities and fields into that space. We'll probably tear down that building, and hopefully we'll build a new rescue squad, and we'll protect the, the surrounding neighborhoods that, around that old school land and property, and that will hopefully become town property as well. And we'll have to work that out in the preceding years, but I think that's in everybody's interest to do that, both the county and the town, as well as the citizens that live in that part of town. Um, thirdly, the new high school. Um, you know, I was part of the group, I live on Wharton Street, which is just a couple blocks from here, that wanted to keep the schools in the downtown area a decade or so ago. Uh, we lost that fight. Uh, we like having the schools downtown. I think it's important for a community to be able to see the buses and the, the kids in the white badges out directing um, and stopping traffic and helping kids cross the street. I think that's important for a small community to be able to see that. But nevertheless, we have a new model now. It's one campus. It's 159 acres or something like that. I went out and walked the campus on Monday night. It's a gorgeous campus. I encourage every single one of you to go out there and look at that hill where that, where that high school will be built. It will be a property that we'll all be proud of, that we'll be love to send our kids and grandkids to, and I think the community will really be well served, especially if we can get a good design on that, and I think we have a good design on that. It's a far better design than what we had many years ago. There's uh, it's paying attention to daylighting, paying attention to how the sun moves, it has windows, it has big um, cafeteria and gym space, and plenty of classrooms. Is it everything we need? Probably not. It's being designed for about 1,400 students. Uh, 1,400 students approximately, when maybe we might need 1,600 in the future. But the classroom wing can be expanded on. The, the main core part, I think, is enough for it. And they have a budget. They, as any project does, any big capital project has a budget that has to be met. Usually it's the program that gets cut a little bit. But right now they're at about 92% of meeting that program. That's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good job. I think the architect's team is doing a good job on that, and hopefully we'll be able to support that. Um, I want to say something about the phasing of that. There are 35%, it's basically schematic design documents. That means the major decisions have been made and now they're just going to work on finishing the design and making it a code applicable and good um, uh, documents for the building to be built from. Um, I'm not that concerned about them being able to do that. I think we'll have a good high school and a good school community at that site. I, I'm going to support it. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question here. This will be a two and a half minute question. Um, we'll have a series of these, these short questions. You, you did one of the long runs. Um, please comment on whether town residential codes and their enforcement are adequate to control problem properties in town. Um, why are, are, are these um, proper or why not? And what incentives or penalties would you propose to improve the situation? Um, let me amend that, that the, what town residential and commercial codes. I uh, want to address both of those. Paul? Well, I think uh, to begin with, what we need to do is not make matters worse. I think that's uh, sticking to uh, uh, zoning the neighborhoods to continue to be neighborhoods. Uh, there was an incident when I was um, uh, planning commission where somebody wanted to move uh, R5, which is still residential, but allows for new places and other properties, uh, wanted to move that into uh, a largely and entirely R4 neighborhood, Miller Southside. Um, and we turned it down. Uh, thought it was a, a, a bad idea to stick that big toe into the uh, R4 properties and uh, get something moving on. So I think the, the first thing we do is uh, stay vigilant in, in, in the zoning. Um, having said that, I believe we have raised fines where we could. We've hired more police people where we could, but I'm gonna have to talk to Richmond about that one because uh, if the Republicans get control of the House, it's very likely that the uh, House Bill 599 funding, uh, and I'm gonna explain where that came from, will be cut, uh, and that, that's the funding that goes to uh, police services and, and sheriff services in the county. Um, 
Yeah, so I think one thing we need to do is uh, keep lobbying Richmond to keep uh, keep the funding as it is, so we don't lose people. And I, I would like to find a ways to uh, bring in more police. Now, uh, again, that's a matter of money. I think uh, as we work towards a new uh, or expanding the building uh, that the police are in, uh, getting new facilities that they can use, uh, I think that'll help uh, recruit uh, more police. And uh, we've got to figure out how to. Uh, how to get whatever it could maybe 10, 12, 15 policemen, police people, to patrol the areas that have the problems on Fridays and Saturdays and Thursdays and Wednesdays and mm -hmm. Tuesdays. Um, I, I don't have an easy solution to that. And I, know, I know people who live in the, in the neighborhoods that are affected are, are frustrated. We've worked with them before. We've tried to increase patrols, uh, but Things continue to happen. And then having said that, I do want to say that uh, uh, I don't consider necessarily having students in the neighborhood to be a particularly bad thing. Uh, it's just some students. Thank you. Um, well, I'll segue from that um, a, a little bit in terms of uh, students in um, neighborhoods. I agree that um, having students in your neighborhood isn't a bad thing. I think that uh, students and um, college students and long term residents can work together. Um, as a community and um, kind of um, uh, uh, deal with kind of neighborhood issues and like ensure that our neighborhoods are civil and then we deal with neighborhood civility and these types of things. When we talk about problem areas in town, problem properties in town, one of the major things that a lot of people think about is over-occupancy and over-occupancy issues. I currently live on Carter Street um, near downtown and um, the, the current zoning regulations or the over-occupancy regulations say that you can only have three um, unrelated people that live in, in the area where I am. And I, I think that that makes sense because it deals with things like uh, parking, um, for example, if you have a, a neighbor who has uh, six people living in a small house, um, they don't have enough driveway space or they're taking up um, a lot of street parking that they shouldn't otherwise do. This is the kind of thing that causes um, problems and um, for, for our properties downtown. And, and this is the sort of thing that I think that the town should be Dealing with and, and for over occupancy, um, it, it's something that's not exactly easy to regulate. Um, the town staff is has limited budgets, just like everyone else, and um, it's not something that they have a lot of resources right now that they can deal with. And it's also something that's very difficult um, uh, to control, short of having a copy of someone's lease where a renter has rented out a property to multiple um, to students or, or otherwise. Um, it's, it's very difficult to control that sort of thing. Even something like increasing the amount of police enforcement on our streets, that wouldn't necessarily deal with a lot of the problem properties or the kind of over occupancy types of issues. Um, but, but there are ways that we can work together as neighbors, um, whether it's students or long-term residents. And, and that's something that I think that I offer kind of a unique voice for dealing with as someone who's experienced life in Blacksburg as a Virginia Tech student who's now a permanent resident and lives in a neighborhood and is concerned about these types of issues. Um, I, I agree that we need to be careful and thoughtful um, with our zonings. I know the question asked about both residential and commercial, so I don't have uh, much more time to get into the commercial aspect, but I think that we, we need to be very careful and very thoughtful about how we zone properties and, and vigilant to make sure our community meets our community standards. Thank you. John? Two and a half minutes may not be enough for me to speak on this issue. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I, I live in the downtown, town down edge neighborhood, which has a tremendous amount of student rentals and rental properties in general. Um, one thing you have to remember is we're a Dillon rural state. And what that means is that local governments cannot pass laws that the state legislature hasn't already approved. So that really limits our ability in, in terms of the enforcement question that you asked in terms of what we can do. We, um, I know there are people in this room that tried some neighborhood inspection issues. Um, we tried that for a while, then that got shot down at the, at the state level. Um, I'd like to see that we could bring that back, but that's gonna take, that's gonna take lobbying at the, at the state level in order for us to have that power and that authority to do that. Um, you know, there's lifestyle conflicts. You have students that go to bed at, at 2 or 3 in the morning and people like me to go to bed at 9.30 or 10 and get up at 6 in the morning and go to work. And at, at my age now, I'm just not into being up all night. And, and, and a lot of these kids, on Saturday night, I had 80 people in front of my house at the football game. Um, it, it's, it's, there are issues that are completely out of control. 
The town is not doing enough on it in some cases. In some cases, they're not able to do enough on it. We have to do something about the quality of life issues for the permanent residents that live downtown, or they're going to move elsewhere. It's just that simple. And we're going to have a downtown community that's completely rental by nature, that's either owned by absentee landlords that live out of the town, out of the region, out of the state, <laughs> or even some that live in. Now, it's not students, and it's not rentals, per se. I, I live in a neighborhood that has plenty of, of rentals by people that live in the neighborhood. And in 23 years, I have never had one issue with any of those folks. It's often from the density from where you have a 28 bedroom apartment across from what are essentially residential houses, the density of people, and the fact that the landlords really just don't care. And, and that's the issue. We have to get to the landlords. We have to get to the people that own the properties and convince them that we can partner with them to make the neighborhoods a presentable thing. I don't think it's in anybody's interest to have the permanent residents want to move out of their neighborhoods because the quality of life has been deteriorated to such a high degree. Are there positive things? Yes, there are. I know there's a group around here that some people in this room even that are considering some bike patrols in the neighborhood and communi extra communication. One thing I know I do, I go and talk to as many people as I can as soon as they move in and, and introduce myself and tell them about my family and let them introduce themselves. And, and, that, and sometimes that works. I've started to talk to different landlords and sometimes they're very helpful. But we really have problems. The town has to do more. That's something I want to try to work on in the next couple of years. Okay, uh, just to I want to be clear, the, my understanding of the question is that what you're asking is specifically uh, is whether the town codes are adequate and their enforcement are, are adequate. Mm -hmm. okay. And if not, what should be done? Okay. And my answer is the town code is acceptable. It's pretty okay. Uh, there are difficulties that we've encountered, like the rental inspection program that was shot down at the state uh, level because of Dillon's rule. Uh, we attempted another kind of um, uh, ordinance. Uh, in fact, lots of localities have tried to get an ordinance, uh, a law through the General Assembly, and it's shot down by real estate interests. We wanted to do something as simple as create a registry of derelict owners for downtown properties. And so the, the state did not pr uh, permit us to even create a, a list. Okay. So that gives you an idea. Uh, how far reaching some of those prohibitions are. Um, but several things come to mind here. Uh, and, but the, the I guess the, the short answer is the codes are okay, the enforcement has fallen short and continues to fall short. And one of the reasons why, and this is a theme that goes throughout, is we are a small town. We are a small town, we live large, we have big aspirations, but when all is said and done, when we need something done, we have a staff of possibly two people who can change that zone of our two people who do all the enforcement for the 45,000 of the rest of us. And so we are understaffed and we are not getting to the enforcement piece of it. That's just true. Um, I like what uh, John had to say about meeting your neighbor. I live in a neighborhood that's also downtown, uh, the uh, Miller Edition neighborhood, which is, I describe it as sort of the low rent district of Draper Crescent. And, um, and I have about half the people around me are in rental properties and about half are, are owner occupied. And that's, owner occupation is, is really pivotal. Um, the uh, neighborhood that's deteriorating somewhat now is uh, Burris Drive subdivision and that's become about 60% rental. And uh, there's the danger. And, uh, and, and the seriousness of this is pointed out by um, a study that was done for Parks and Rec recently. 71% of the properties in town limits are uh, rentals. So it's something we need to work out, but I, I'm uncomfortable with the student regular person divide because what we need to see is civility in all our relations, in government relations, in citizen relations, on football days, and that's not to do with anybody that lives here. We need greater civility in many different contexts. So I think that needs to be the goal. I want to just call out one thing that, uh, that Ann Linden said in an email to me. Uh, a long string of uh, emails went around about owner occupancy and uh, neighborhood enforcement and the behavior of people generally. And Ann said very pointedly, if the students can't live here, where can they live? So we need to address all these questions with that answer in our heads. Where, where are they going to live? They need to live in the, in the heart of our town. Thank you. Okay. Um, the 
the next question, another two and a half minute question. Um, do you believe that Blacksburg is a bicycle and pedestrian friendly community? And what are the greatest impediments to increased walking and cycling in Blacksburg? And what are your priorities for implementing the bikeway pedestrian master plan that citizens are currently drafting for inclusion in the comprehensive? Okay. Um, alternative transportation was one of the four major issues that I campaigned on in the 2009 election. It's something that's very near and dear to me and something I'll continue um, to be talking about in this election. There, there are many reasons why it's important to um, have a community that's friendly to pedestrians and cyclists um, and people who use alternative transportation. One, it um, reduces greenhouse gas emissions and it's more environmentally friendly. Um, two, it saves money. There was in 2008 a report by the American Public Transportation Association that someone who uses public uh, transportation instead of driving will have an average savings of more than uh, $8,700. Certainly, um, not, not everyone can rely entirely on um, alternative and public transportation, so that statistic doesn't apply to everyone. But, it, but that just goes to show that it, this is an economic development types of issue. Um, and we, we do need to have a community for both environmental and economic reasons that um, uh, make sure that we're pedestrian, bike, and transit um, uh, friendly. Um, I, I think that Blacksburg is a very um, bike, pedestrian, and transit friendly community as it is um, now, but there are definite rooms for improvement. I'm glad that we have programs like the Safe Routes to School program, which are extending um, sidewalks near things like Harding Elementary School, which are making um, our community safer for students and making it so that they can walk from their neighborhoods to um, their school, and I think that that's a great thing. Um, I also think that um, th th there's some room to um, create, create more bike lanes and that sort of thing in town. I, I know that there's, um, there's a controversy with the North Main Street um, improvement project that it doesn't include um, uh, bike lanes, and I, I know there's a gentleman who's come to some recent town council meetings and talked um, about that and how it affects his um, bike shop. And I, I do hear his concerns, but I also understand um, why um, the, the town decided to do um, wider sidewalks instead of um, including a bike lane. Um, I, I talked about in the last election about the need to have a fully connected bike path in our downtown area. And it is a little bit disappointing that we aren't going to have a fully connected bike path, but I think it is important uh, with things like the uh, $89 million Center for the Arts, which is coming downtown, um, and um, the, the emphasis on the arts and the North Main Street Improvement Project, that we also work on creating a pedestrian-friendly um, community uh, as well. We've got to negotiate um, what we do in, 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 in terms of alternative and public transportation to ensure that um, our community creates more opportunities for people to do this. Just going back to the economic and the environmental reasons to make sure that um, our community is bike and pedestrian friendly. Are, are we a bike and pedestrian friendly town? Um, we're trying. You know, we made some good improvements over the years. We have a nice trail system that people can get on and bike, walk, bike, and skate, and, and among other more forms of transportation. People that know me know that I walk all over town and run all over this town when I was able to run and now bike quite a bit. I'm passionate about these issues, but we need to do more. It's that simple. Um, I'm not happy that we have the North Main Street improvement project that lacks a bike lane. I don't think it's an either or situation. I think it's both and. I think what's happened is you have designers and civil engineers and traffic people who are more concerned about some issues and they don't list that as a priority. It wasn't a priority, so it's not in there. Uh, we could have done all of that, in my opinion. I think the College Avenue promenade right now likes lacks a bike lane. I think that's a mistake. I'm going to keep saying that at every chance that I get. Sooner or later, you know, we should be connected if we keep if we put the lanes in there. It's no different than putting broadband every time we open up the ground and have an opportunity to put the conduits in the ground to do that. And any time we don't do that, we're making a mistake. And I'm, personally, I don't care what the excuses are. I think that I think they're mostly excuses, and it's because we haven't made it a priority. Um, there are other forms of transportation. Not everybody is able enough, particularly to bike and walk and, and move as an able-bodied person, I'm fortunate in that regard, but I must remember that not everybody can do that. So we need accessible parking spaces, we need bus drop-offs and bus transportation, and we do, we have a great bus service here in town, Blackford Transit, that's serving not only our town, but the school, as well as Christiansburg. Uh, I support those ideas, I support, I have a copy of the 
Town of Blackford Prevention Plan, my plan here. It's a working document. It hasn't really been published yet. Of course, I'm going to support that. I'm going to support that inclusion into the comp plan. I'm going to support that committee that's working on that. And hopefully, they will lobby and, and get all of our designers and our people that design our roads and corridors to include bike lanes whenever we can in every single case. Anything else is just simply not acceptable for our town. Other towns have done it. Look at Eugene, Oregon. Look at Denver. Look at Boulder. Um, there's plenty of places where people can do that. It's just a question of priority and will. And uh, that's really all I have to say about that. Yeah, uh, I would say, uh, this, this may be splitting hairs, but I have some information here on the needs assessment that was just done for the Parks and Rec uh, program. And I would say, based on our data here, that we are very friendly. Uh, we are a very pedestrian, bicycle friendly uh, community. Do we have all the paths we need and want? No, we do not. Uh, but that's different than being open to the idea of needing them, wanting them, and using them more. Uh, so that's a distinction I'd like to make. You know, you can blame it on topography. It's a hilly kind of place. It's not as easy to bike here as it would be in Florida. You know, or you could. Uh, uh, blame it on narrow streets and older infrastructure in the downtown, and but none of that explains how come you can do it in Amsterdam or other European mm -hmm. countries or the, or the towns that you just named, John. So uh, you know, part of it is just willingness. Part of it is making that cultural shift. Uh, but there is a lot of um, these these things I have in front of me here indicate, uh, for example, um, the level of support for various actions. The very most high ranking one. The, the highest ranking one of all was build greenway trail for walk, bike, and connect parks. 67%. Um, and uh, uh, the households that need a very, uh, various parks and recreation facilities, uh, the, the top one was 84% said that they would use walking, biking trails. And the national average for that is 69% people, uh, people would say that they wanted that. So 84 in Blacksburg compared to a 69% uh, average nationally, yeah, we, we're friendly, we want it, we just need to get there. Um, I did a lot of research on why, why um, let's say I have 49 seconds left. I did a lot of research, okay. um, I, I did a lot of research on why there is uh, no uh, bike lane in our traffic, our new traffic circle. I think that would have been a mistake. And if we, and if we had put it through there, it would have been an orphan pathway because it does not connect in the downtown. So some people think we goofed. Some people thought we never thought about it. Somebody, or, some people are convinced no matter what you tell them that it was still a mistake. But let me tell you, the traffic circles generally will reduce the uh, serious and fatal accident rate by 80%. You get a 40% reduction overall in accidents of all types. And if you put a traffic circle in one, the fatalities go back up. To the, almost to the 80% mark. So uh, the engineers told us the only way to do that safely is you have to really own the lane. That doesn't sound like a good traffic plan to me, is that you have to, uh, you have to encourage your bikers to have an attitude in order to claim their space. That, that's not a good pathway. Could have done more of a vertical attitude than a horizontal attitude. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yes. horizontal and vertical. Yeah, I see your point. <laughs> um, we are both blessed and cursed by the decisions of our predecessors. And in the case of uh, biking, I think, taking that into consideration, I think we do a pretty good job as a bicycle pedestrian friendly community. I think once we figured out that bicycling and, and, and walking were good ways to go, probably back in the late 80s, uh, I think we started doing what we could to uh, uh, get uh, trails and, and bike lanes going. Uh, having said that, there are just some places that because of the way that we're built in the past, it's, it's going to be hard to try to uh, get something in place. Having said that, I do want to uh, particularly address the question about the priorities for the money <coughs> by the industry master plan um, that citizens are currently drafting for inclusion in the comprehensive plan. When I was in council, I proposed that we find out what the cost would be of substantially completing that plan, then put a referendum to the voters whether they would accept a two cent real estate tax increase or some other kind of tax increase to raise the funds to specifically take care of that issue. I think we need to get uh, the uh, plan substantially completed and I think uh, that would be one way of doing that. Um, 
when I was on council, I worked with uh, Steve Ross, the deputy town manager, to get uh, more bike racks downtown and also to place them in more uh, uh, visual places. Uh, there was one by the Art Armory that was kind of near the back that nobody could see. Uh, we moved that forward and we tried to put in some more bike uh, racks where people could see them and make more use of them. Although the gate uh, around uh, Gillies and, and that area seems to sort of be a popular place. Um, I think in, in regards to uh, the issue of uh, North Main Street, I think we should talk to Tech about bike lanes paralleling Main Street. They're going to have the Art Center, and they've got the Henderson Lawn. Why can't, why couldn't we put in some sort of pathway there? Uh, maybe even get around College Avenue, although I'm not sure that can happen. And I do want to say one of the things, since the, the Director of Public Works is here, that I've spent, I spent four years on council bugging him about biodiesel in our, in our transit system. And uh, our vehicles, and uh, we've gotten pretty good, pretty good ways along that line. So I want to thank you for that, and uh, also thank uh, uh, our transit system too. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, in my phone. Uh, or, no, you did the last one. So we're back. We're back to John. <coughs> what do you think of the top two or three priorities? for downtown revitalization, and how would you implement it? Um, I think we've done a wonderful job recently downtown revitalization, and I have a list right here. Um, I can find it. Uh, there, there are several projects we have that are, that are either complete or in the works or in some sort of design process. Um, I think the North Main Street improvements will really help the downtown. I think the, um, the widening of the road, of the sidewalks for pedestrian friendliness and new amenities and the consistency and making the downtown from the old middle school property of Prices Fork will um, change our perception and our experience of what the downtown is. I think that will help the downtown merchants and the folks at Kent Square and all of that area. I think College Avenue Promenade is going to be an excellent project. It has some deficiencies in it, which I spoke of earlier, but in general, I think it's going to be a great project for everybody, both the school and the town and the merchants. I think the Center for the Arts that Virginia Tech is working on right now is scheduled to be complete in two years. I think that's going to be a fantastic project, and I think that's going to put some pressure on some of the neighboring properties to up their development and um, provide some more amenities to permanent residents in town. I also think that the Alexander Black House renovation is a great project that's going to really um, uh, change the perception of what the town's doing and what we say about the downtown and people's experience there. And with the Armory, the different galleries, the Lyric, Alexander Black House, the Center for the Arts, and the creation of what we're calling the Arts District, I think that's going to be an excellent experience for most people and that will contribute to downtown revitalization. There are two other things I want to mention which are ongoing. I think the historic district, the creation of the district and the strengthening of, those, of that ordinance and the experience of people that they know about our excellent and extremely unique history, I think that will contribute to the downtown awareness and revitalization. And the last but not least, I think, is our incredible farmer's market. Uh, that's been just a remarkable uh, project. And people come from all over, not only the town, but the region to experience that market, both the structure of the timber frame wide oak, as well as what we have used, used that for traditionally, as well as the other opportunities we have for future use, such as music, Christmas events, and other types of events, has really revitalized the downtown. Of course, the Lyric Theater was something that happened several years ago. And that's really something that um, that we cherish and use frequently, both my wife and I, and I know plenty of people can experience that. So I, I'm excited about the downtown. I think we're, we, we're right to focus on that. The downtown is our culture and our identity. If we lose our identity, we're going to lose our soul. So I'm glad we're focusing on that. Um, well, I guess, uh, I, I think John's done a really excellent job of um, calling uh, for all of us to mind the fact that they, uh, the downtown is in very much better shape than it was even just four years ago. Uh, and uh, he's named quite a few projects that are just making it look really good. So I think our prospects are great. I think certainly it's one of the nicest in the region. Uh, and when other people, uh, you know, uh, look for exemplars, downtown Blacksburg is one. Um, but you asked for uh, what are the three priorities now? And right. so I will, uh, I will go on to that. Um, I worked 
with uh, first as director of the Downtown Merchants of Blacksburg, and then I transitioned once I uh, joined council to the Downtown um, uh, Revitalization Committee under the capable leadership of uh, Vice Mayor Susan Anderson. And uh, so we have had remarkable success with creating a package of incentives for downtown businesses to move in and improve properties. Especially, there has been good success by directing CDBG funds to facade improvements. We've got five or six completed or in the works, and uh, that has been a very attractive program. And it was almost instantly successful. The first round of grants were, were uh, attractive to people widely, and we're into, I think, now a third set of grants. Um, I think, uh, though, that the next thing that really needs to be uh, happening, and it is a product of that uh, committee, is there was some work being done on recruitment. And we really need to do a much more energetic job of recruiting. Um, and I would, I would uh, focus specifically on specialty retail for the downtown area and also on tech companies. They found their way downtown on their own. We need to be there to catch. We've got TechPad uh, above PKs. And anchoring the other end of town, it will soon be Modia. There was some talk of Rackspace joining them on the old middle school uh, site, and that may, uh, that may be in flux, it's hard to say. But we would be foolish to uh, not be courting the young entrepreneurial professionals who tell us loudly they want to stay in our town and they want to do well. Um, so that's number one. The second thing would be focused rehabs on Roanoke Street that would help to bring up the morale and also the, uh, the uh, property values in both Bennett Hill Progress and at the 16 squares on the other side. Um, and I have a whole list of items made out of time. Paul? Well, I think uh, starting out with John's list certainly says that we've been working on, on downtown, the middle school site, and uh, keeping an eye on that and making sure that it is a mix of not just Mobile but also uh, residential housing some commercial, uh, some uh, off, uh, yeah, commercial space, maybe some office space. Uh, the Farmers Market, the College Avenue, the North Main Projects, the Fine Arts Center, the Black House, the Blacksburg Motor Company, which has the uh, highest uh, the platinum lead uh, uh, certification, and of course the Lear Theater, which kind of started downtown revitalization. I think, I think uh, as those things uh, take shape, the ones that are not done, I think will be a natural draw to downtown, but we can't just sit on our butts and wait for people to come to us. I think what we need to do is look to draw people downtown, not so much new businesses in the commercial or uh, um, uh, restaurant business, but, but in the in the business like Medea, uh, companies that uh, can bring a lot of people who not only want to work downtown, but want to live downtown. And if they want to live downtown, they're going to try to eat downtown. And that, that should inspire a little more variety in our restaurants, shall I say. Um, I think one of the problems is uh, trying to identify spaces that are not just, uh, that are not existing right now. I think we've got to go and look at downtown and see if there are spaces that we can maybe designate as areas that we could redevelop uh, into their own buildings for, for tech companies that want to come in. Um, I know that would probably draw some controversy depending on where these are, but I think uh, there are probably some sites uh, around the downtown area that we can look at and try to do that. If we get people downtown living, and, and living they'll be uh, or working, they'll be living and they'll be eating downtown, and, I think that's, and they'll be shopping downtown, and I think that's a pretty good stuff. I did want to make uh, one comment about uh, uh, our last topic. Uh, about the neighborhoods. Um, and I lost my note. Oh, here they are. In 1980, Tech had 16,000 students and 9,000 lived on campus. Today, they've got 28,000 students and 9,000 live on campus. There's your housing problem. I think we should work on trying to get Tech to uh, offer a little more housing on campus. That's a, that's a difference of 12,000. Uh, and you know, where do we put them on campus? Thank you. Um, in terms of downtown revitalization, there's a lot of things that the, the town advisor can do is to work to improve our uh, downtown area. The, the first one I'd like to talk about a little bit is one that Leslie mentioned, and that's um, retaining our existing shops and restaurants and commercial and retail opportunities and recruiting 
um, new ones to our downtown um, area. In 2009, the Blackfoot Town Council passed a resolution that created a tourism uh, district overlay as part of downtown, and it created an incentives package um, to recruit uh, and create incentives for entrepreneurs like Leslie was talking about um, to come uh, downtown and open up shop in our downtown area. And I think working um, with that, I haven't heard much from that uh, since it passed in 2009. I think that um, working on types of issues where we recruit uh, new businesses to come um, to our downtown area are exactly the kinds of things that we need to uh, be doing. And there are other ways that we can help retain um, our, our existing shops and restaurants that are in town. Um, Leslie also mentioned the Community Development Block Grant um, Program. I, I also serve on the Health and Community Development Advisory Board, um, and we, it was recently appointed to, and um, we've been working on um, the, the facade program, which helps kind of revitalize different um, parts of town. You, you may have seen um, in different areas where there's been construction on the facade um, of those areas, and that helps um, create a good will between the town of Blacksburg and our business community and helps uh, beautify our downtown area. Um, second, I think that making sure that these, these projects that are going on in town, whether it's the North Main Street um, improvement, which will definitely um, Make, again, make our town uh, beautiful and also deal with um, uh, Virginia Tech's constructing the Center for the Arts um, and the focus for the arts um, in the College Promenade area. Um, making sure all of those sorts of projects um, work together to improve our downtown area and increase both traffic um, uh, downtown. Also, um, like was mentioned previously, the Old Blackford Middle School property with Medea coming. Um, downtown, I think that's a great thing and that will have a way to extend in what people think of as being our downtown um, and ensuring um, that it's successful. I, I don't have very much uh, more time, but I will say that um, downtown revitalization is just a part of economic development. And then there are other things that we also need to do um, to ensure that our community is successful, whether it's recruiting more high tech um, types of businesses that uh, bring more jobs to our community. Um, or um, working with the Blackfoot Business Climate Task Force and uh, uh, types of recommendations um, that's coming out with to improve communication between the town and the business community. Okay, um, we're, uh, we're going to shift gears here a little bit and give you a little bit more time for, for this next question. Um, it's, a, it's an important question to citizen first. It's about governance and, and how it's conducted and how it's done. Ideas for improving the quality of local life in town often change as they move from conception to implementation. Developers have been known to mislead citizens, town staff, and elected officials. They can switch. What steps would you take to ensure that truthful and accurate information is always provided to and issued from the town of Blacksburg? How would you harmonize the objectives of a diverse citizenry with the implementation of those objectives by town staff? It's a five-minute question. And uh, Leslie, uh, you can fill it. Yeah, I'm not sure. But, yeah. um, okay, so what steps would you take to ensure that truthful and accurate information is always provided to an issue from the town of Glasgow? You cannot always assure that the town of Blacksburg is always going to get truthful information because we get it from so many sources. Um, I, I'll go back to this example that I that I named a little bit earlier. On uh, most of the weekend, I was hearing you know people were anticipating um, that the uh, Blacksburg High School CUP was going to be approved on Tuesday. And I began um, getting emails, and I began hearing from concerned citizens who were getting apparently accurate information from people who were involved at the ground level with planning for the school. And um, I, I grew very concerned also. And so as soon as Monday arrived, and when I continued to get uh, now phone calls from citizens, uh, I went directly uh, to members of this planning committee. and. Um, but did not stop there and ended up speaking uh, also through the day as I went to various meetings and took a, a, I took a tour of the site along with John and with Susan. Um, uh, spoke with the director of facilities for the school. Um, spoke with um, uh, members of uh, the school board 
But then also uh, went to uh, the Mon actually on the Monday night I went and spoke with Jim Politis, the head of the uh, Montgomery County Supervisors. And it took about the first four or five conversations to get the forward blown picture. So if I had to answer um, exactly what would you do, you, you have to have a really finely tuned BS detector. And it needs to <laughs> almost always be on. And uh, people aren't venal, you know. Usually they're worried or hurt or concerned for any number of reasons. And so you need to have a really good screening mechanism. You also need to have the passions and the, and the passion of the patients to keep on slogging through the process. Um, so, you know, we will hear from citizens and then uh, we sometimes, you know, you can get good information from other uh, localities or sometimes not. Um, there's typical problems with just, you know, people can be available or not available. It depends on whether it's an hour weekend or, you know, it's before or after hours or whatever. Uh, it takes perseverance. It takes perseverance and it also takes, I think, um, a, a carefully honed, sense of what is appropriate. Something that has come up on town council in the three and a half years that I have served is, um, you know, uh, uh, working with town staff. There, There is a mature and careful balance that takes place between you don't micromanage, you just, you don't do that. Right? And if you've ever hired, fired, or, or um, managed people, you learn to do it respectfully. Your success is a product of their success. Your, your role is to see to it that that staff, we have 300, we have a staff of approximately 300 for this town, and maybe 250, I think I just read the figures, for uh, seasonal and part-time. It's a big staff. You can't be up in their face all the time. And also, if you fantasize that you can be in control of all that, you're wrong. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, all these, all these, um, you know, how you behave depends on with whom you are speaking. But always, you need to be uh, engaged in an I and thou with members of staff, with members of the community, with your colleagues on town council, um, with other elected officials. Um, I take care not to micromanage, but I also take care not to fraternize. I, I don't like cronyism. I don't like cliquishness. I don't respect it in other people, and I, it gives me red flags when I see some of that take place within organizations. I try to make my standards clear without shaming people. Um, so that's, you know, I, I guess, you know, that's my answer to that question. Um, now, you said, how do you harmonize the objectives of a diverse citizenry with the implementation of those objectives by town staff? And my note to myself is, I don't know what this means. But now that you say it again, I mean, I think I do have one response to that, and that is town council sets policy. Actually, that makes this plainer, too, the whole conversation. We don't manage the staff. The town manager manages the staff. But town council sets policy, and we need to be clear, respectful, and unapologetic. Uh, so that's how I would seek to get that kind of balance. Thank you. Well, let me start by providing one of my uh, famous sayings that 90% of the rules that we have on the books are for 10% of the developers. If we could get rid of the developers who lie or who put up shoddy developments or in other ways uh, mislead us, uh, we could roll back 90% of the regulations we have, and I think that would go a long step towards uh, uh, getting uh, truthful and accurate information out there. But that's not going to happen. And I'll give you an example of uh, the problem with uh, the truth. The truth is always what some people think it is, not necessarily what it actually is. Uh, when the urban development areas came up uh, a few weeks ago, um, all they were was were to, it was uh, uh, the state, Order localities to enact these urban development areas. And uh, we took uh, what we essentially had already uh, picked out as areas of uh, 
areas we wanted to redevelop anyway. And uh, uh, took those and tried to concentrate on those as areas where we might do more redevelopment, more, more rebuilding, more, more bringing back the areas to uh, where, where they should be. Uh, an example would be uh, on North Main Street uh, in, the, in the Eats area. That area is that vastly underused. Uh, I think we can do a lot better job with that. Well, we had people who showed up at the council public hearing. One person showed up, she said she lived in a, on Apperson Drive, I believe, and she said, is this going to mean that you can take my property to build a, a commercial enterprise? That's exactly opposite of what this thing does. But some tea partiers came up, see, Bristol, Abingdon, Floyd County, and Eric, maybe Pulaski uh, County, spoke at that hearing and spread the rumors that this Urban Development uh, Act is some sort of UN conspiracy to take over the world, I don't know. Um, you know, but somebody is always going to have an axe to grind and truth is not important. Uh, I don't know, I don't know what you can do to, to, to deal with that other than listen and decide uh, the people who are making the intelligent decisions. I think when we do work, uh, to make decisions, working with a diverse citizenry and uh, uh, also uh, uh, try to get things done in neighborhoods that maybe not everybody is in favor of. I think we, we need to uh, uh, not just make a decision and leave it at that. When we approved the Progress Street extension, uh, the neighborhood, the, the Shenandoah neighborhood was not very pleased with that because that would be more traffic. So we formed a committee, uh, Tom Sherman and I, and, and uh, Del Shermer and a number of residents from the area. And we took a look at what else we could do uh, with that project. And we, uh, one th for one thing, we, uh, uh, there was a big bump on, on uh, Progress Street between the two Seminole Drive intersections. We uh, cut that down. Uh, while we were talking about the area, we, we uh, got over to Whipple Drive and uh, looked at uh, making a continuous sidewalk there uh, because that's something that was vastly needed. Um, that road can be very dangerous because people tend to fly on it. And also we provided street lighting on the road drive because that was another uh, uh, thing that I might consider. Uh, improving the Patrick Henry Progress signal. I know not everybody might be happy with the stoplights, but uh, we did that. We improved the uh, how it works for turning and we reduced the speed to 25 miles an hour. Nobody goes that speed, but we try. Uh, so that's an idea that way we can communicate with people after we make a decision and make sure that not only are, uh, that we're giving them the truth about what we're trying to do, but also maybe try to go a bit further and uh, uh, get them to uh, uh, help them with projects that they may see as that should have been a part of this. The other thing I think as far as uh, getting the word out, the truthful and accurate information is, as much as possible, keep the meetings of council open. I know there are times when there have to be closed meetings, but uh, when, we, when I was on council and we had to appoint a new council member, we did an open session. Uh, my last council meeting, work session, we uh, uh, did a vote to, uh, to consider appointments for the next uh, boards and commissions for the next term and uh, the vote to uh, go into closed session was six to one. I was the one. I didn't think we needed to go into closed session for that. I think there's a lot of opportunities to uh, stay open that we're not taking advantage of, and I think that's one way to uh, uh, get across that truthfulness and that trust to the citizens. Thank you. Well, I'd like to go back a little bit to the, the question which started, ideas for improving the quality of life in the town often change. They move from conception and development. Developers have been known to miss these citizens, town staff, and elected officials. And you mentioned um, you're giving us um, five minutes for this question because it's something that's near and dear um, to citizens first. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that first before I get to the um, two other questions. I think um, there's been a lot of different issues in town um, with developers and with development, um, both good and bad. Um, uh, which have kind of brought about and why we're talking about this today and why we have that question. Um, certainly, season first started around the Tom Street sewer um, kinds of question uh, and whether we wanted a more environmentally friendly or a type of uh, development that um, a, a developer could profit from. And then um, more recently in 2007, there was the first and main phase two, um, which, which really divided our community and um, raised a lot of questions about 
uh, land use and how we want to grow and how we want our community to prosper and what our community standards are um, in the town of Blacksburg. So I just wanted to go back just a little bit to give a little bit of background for um, why this is something that's um, so important. Um, so I'll answer these you know, two parts of the question separately. What steps would you take to ensure the truth and accurate information um, is getting out? Um, a lot, I think there's been a lot of great ideas so far, um, but um, one of the most important is that communication is key. Um, I got my degree in communication. I've been working in public relations for the past five years so that I know um, that there's a way um, to relay information in a way that uh, inspires goodwill among citizens or among who you are, your constituent, your stakeholders are, and um, a way to tell a message in a way um, that people can understand it. Um, I agree that, uh, with Paul that openness of government is something that's very important. It's something that builds goodwill um, with community, um, and it's something that I think that if I'm elected to the town council, that I would support um, ensuring. And I think that the town does do a good job with relaying things like um, our minutes and the agendas and time and announcing meetings and uh, televising meetings and making sure that um, we are relaying information in a way that's open and transparent. Um, uh, second, um, I think it's, uh, and going a little bit more to the other question of how do we harmonize the objectives of the diverse citizenry with um, what the town staff is working on, education is also um, uh, key. Sometimes town staff have more information than uh, uh, just uh, someone uh, come on the street that may have just read through a blog or through something else um, about an issue and it doesn't have all the information that necessarily the town staff, that doesn't mean the town staff are always right, um, but I think that town staff do have a role to provide unbiased opinions and provide um, information to our uh, citizenry and I think the urban development areas are a great example. I serve, um, and Paul does also, on the Long Ranch Planning Committee um, for the town and this is something we've worked on since uh, January, um, I don't remember a single person coming during the citizens' comments portion of our meeting um, to talk about the urban development areas, just to give a little bit of background, urban development areas connect land use and transportation planning that are required um, by the state, and um, we chose, except for the hospital corridor area, um, already what we're doing our mixed-use development to encourage um, development in those areas. It doesn't take away anyone's property rights or anything like that, but still there were citizens who came to the town council meeting when um, and this was up for discussion and up for a vote um, and shared information that was, was false, that was not true. And so um, there's definitely more, and, and this goes back to um, some of the diverse citizenry types of issues. Um, they, they do have a voice, the citizens who came, uh, to, it, certainly these the ones who were from Blacksburg or not. Um, we're not, but they, they do have a voice and they should have a say in our community. And we have to carefully weigh their concerns, um, but at the same time, um, we also have to take into account the town staff's knowledge of the issues and how um, we can deal with uh, those sorts of things. Um, some specific things that we could um, perhaps do um, to deal with, and I like Leslie's comment about the, the BS detector. Um, we have to stay vigilant um, when dealing with new development or land use types of issues. Just um, for one, because they're so controversial um, and they have been in the past and they've divided our community, we want Blacksburg to move forward in a way um, that ensures that it meets our community standards, but it also continues to grow and prosper. So we need to stay vigilant, whether it's um, including site plans as part of the, the proper process, um, or working to ensure that um, uh, new types of development uh, adhere to our comprehensive plan, which we don't believe really about today, um, um, or also letting the town staff do their hard work, um, but also remaining, keeping them accountable and ensuring that they um, are recognizing, carefully weighing the needs of our diverse citizens, but also um, giving their opinion and their um, unbiased and balanced approach to uh, town governments. John? Um, it's your right as citizens to know what your professional staff and your elected officials are doing. There's, in no case, is that not your right and your ability to do so. It is our duty to communicate that to you let you know what we're working on, what's what's going on in the town, and it's your duty to pay attention. And I know that most of the people in this room do do that. But really, when you think about it, if you go to the council meetings and work sessions and stuff, it's 30 people, 40 people, 50 people, and if that. And um, you know, you need an informed citizenry that pays attention, 
and ask questions, and goes to the website to look at the agendas and the town council issues that are coming before us, and, and to help us out. We can't know everything, and we have to hear your opinions about what you want to see happen. That, that's, the, that's the fundamental part of what good governance is, is an involved citizenry, an involved press, and an involved citizens that inform their officials what their views are on things. And it's our job to act on that. We have a professional staff, and I think we have a, a, a council that researches issues and does their very best to understand the ins and outs, the pros and cons of any, any issue before us. In a, in a small town, land use issues are almost always the most contentious. And in a small town of ours, which is bounded at roughly 19 square miles, um, where we're bordering on civic, residential, churches, business, commercial, and, and other uses, where we, we're literally right next to each other, anytime you have some change in that, that's going to get a lot of attention. And people often don't deal well with change. And sometimes when that change is happening, when things are talked about or, or, or plans are submitted, or even initial discussions happen, rumors start happening, and then you have misinformation that things that sort of spiral out of control. Um, I think we do a pretty good job of trying to um, communicate as well as we can what the true issues are and where the real conflicts lie. Uh, but you know, not everyone's perfect. I think, I think though, with our open work sessions, open council meetings, television, that, um, that you can get on the web and watch, or you can watch it on the WTOB, we make every opportunity for every citizen that wants to participate and pay attention for them to know what the town staff and the town council are working on. As Leslie mentioned earlier, we have, the council has three employees. We have the town manager, we have the town lawyer, and we have the clerk. Everyone else is the town manager's employee. That's how, that's how local government works, really, all across, all across the United States. Um, so, you know, what we can do, as Leslie said, is, is set policy, and it's the staff and the manager's um, duty to implement that. Um, if there's a communication breakdown, we have to work on that. And in my view, that's simply not acceptable. Um, because if we say that we want policy, from my point of view, that policy is really coming from you, what you want to see happen. When there's conflict between, say, the development community and the neighborhoods, I have to make a decision based on comments from people that I trust and know and people I think have balanced views on these issues to try to make a policy uh, statement and take a vote on a particular issue. I supported 1450 when it happened several years ago. I still support uh, requirements of that nature because any large commercial development um, above the 50,000 square threshold, which I believe is where it is right now, is of such a magnitude that it has to go through the CUP process. It has to have the eyes and attention of neighbors and friends and the comp plan and the planners and the elected officials and to have that review in the biggest and broadest way possible. If we should err, we should err in the part of covering things too much and not too little. Are there cases when we have closed meetings? Yes, there are. They really only happen in two ways. They happen if we have a personnel issue. And I think that's generally a rule across the state when people have closed meetings. And sometimes when we're discussing real estate property or cases that we have and we're working, trying to work out some settlement with a, uh, a litigant that has issues with the town and we don't want that, those issues to get out in the public, I think that's fair and judicious and we try to be judicious about that in every case. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know what else to say about good governance. I think it's critical for us. Of course I support it. Um, have we always done it? I don't know, but I think we're really working on it. And I think this council, as it's presently constituted, is a, is a firm believer in that as a, as a primary principle of what our duty is to our neighbors, friends, constituents, and fellow citizens. So I pledge to continue to do that and work on that at every opportunity. Okay, we have uh, one last question here. Um, sort of to, to wind things around, it's a two and a half minute question and then we'll get our summaries. Uh, Virginia Tech and the town of Blacksburg live in a symbiotic relationship. However, many feel that the town does not get a fair deal in the relationship. How can the town council, what can the town council do to improve that relationship? Paul? Well, let me begin with an editorial in the New York Times dated April 1st, 2006. The Blacksburg Councilman Paul Lancaster has a dream. He 
dues of the day when a meal eaten on the campus of Virginia Tech is treated and taxed equally as any other meal eaten in the town of Blacksburg. More to it, the final line is Tech should make Lancaster a dream come true. We ain't there yet. Uh, we still need to work on that. I think, I don't, I don't, I really truly don't understand Tech's problem with this because actually Tech would gain money, they get a percentage of the taxes that are collected. So go figure. Um, having said that, uh, there actually is a lot of cooperation that goes on between the, uh, the two entities. Uh, everything from uh, the airport to uh, uh, a regular meeting of the uh, uh, True Town Council people and some, some uh, uh, high tech officials to discuss other issues. Um, uh, there, there are uh, cooperation, obviously, on things like the police and rescue and things like that. So there are actually a lot of things uh, to which uh, the two entities uh, uh, work hard to get along to try to improve the uh, black state and the union attack. Having said that, um, I think there's more that can be done. I've, you know, a lot's going to, until this meal tax issue is resolved, we're not going to be able to make much progress because it, you know, just refuses to budge and refuses to give up. And I think, uh, I really think we're in the best situation. The problem we have is that uh, we're the only locality in the state with this sort of a problem. 40,000 people living in town and a 28,000 uh, student body. Whereas most of the other locations have either small universities or like uh, Fairfax has George Mason, but Fairfax has a million people. So it's hard to get other localities to see where we're going and try to get them to come along. That's been another issue to try to get something through the General Assembly. I think we can try to work through the General Assembly. I think it's going to take time. Tech has full-time lobbyists up there, and it's going to take a couple of years, but if they're, if they're not willing to come to some sort of agreement, and I think even a payment in lieu of taxes could be a possibility. Uh, I think there's uh, something we can do along that line and try to get, uh, uh, get off this one issue and get to, to working on more ways we can cooperate. <coughs> the uh, new Center for the Arts presents a lot of opportunities for uh, cooperation between the two. I can see uh, uh, festivals that include that and downtown arts uh, uh, venues like the Litter and some of the art galleries. I think uh, there's, you know, Vern Chase and Henderson Lawn. I think there are, again, I think the uh, bikeway along Henderson Lawn paralleling North Main Street and maybe a lot of the Center for Fine Arts as well. I think that could be an answer to the end of the uh, bike lane along the, on North Main Street. So I think there are a lot of areas we still have a chance to, to work on. But, uh, um, until we get past this one issue, it's going to be hard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say that I think that Virginia Tech and the town of Blacksburg do have a good relationship, but there are definite areas where we need um, improvement. The meals tax is already brought up, and this is something that I think is very important. I, I believe that the town of Blacksburg, the uh, Virginia Tech, should collect the meals tax from campus visitors on campus. Of all of Virginia's 15 four year public universities, Virginia Tech is the only one that doesn't reimburse the local communities for meals and lodging. So um, this really gets to a fairness issue of um, our, our downtown restaurants um, or downtown or um, other Blacksburg. Um, hotels competing with the services that are in uh, on Virginia Tech's uh, campus. There, there are more than 100 restaurants in Blacksburg that collect the meals tax, and there's over 20 restaurants and franchises on campus. Um, but the way that we, uh, the, the way Virginia Tech has set it up, it's not collecting um, the meals tax. This isn't something that would affect uh, Virginia Tech uh, students because they're already exempt under the current um, law, and it's not something that would financially harm. Um, the uh, Virginia Tech's campus or its uh, administration either. Um, Paul already mentioned that the uh, uh, Virginia Tech would actually financially benefit from collecting um, the tax because it would get back a portion of it um, as part of a collector's fee. It would be a small amount, just a few thousand dollars, but still it's not something that would financially um, harm Virginia Tech. Another um, example of the kind of issue that um, is also an tension between the, the town um, in Virginia Tech is um, the Blacksburg Rescue Squad, for example, doesn't receive any support uh, from uh, Virginia Tech, but a lot uh, on the weekends, um, after uh, starting after 9 p.m. on um, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, 
Um, a lot of what they're responding to are Virginia Tech uh, students, um, but um, to my knowledge, they don't receive any type of uh, support. So there are ways that, um, in different types of issues, that we do need to work together. But at the same time, I think that um, the, the town of Blacksburg and Virginia Tech need to um, realize that we, we should live in a symbiotic relationship, this is going back to the question, and that we, we need to realize um, um, the, the potential that we have um, with Virginia Tech here. It offers uh, a major economic boost to the region. It, um, it's uh, one of the largest employers, or the largest employer. Um, um, and I think that there's lots of opportunities, especially for Virginia Tech students, um, to get involved in the community um, and make sure that um, the town and Blacksburg um, the, the town of Blacksburg and Virginia Tech work together cooperatively um, and have a good relationship. Most people in Blacksburg have some relation to Virginia Tech, um, and some have very direct and specific relations. Um, I think I'm a pretty good example of that. Um, I'm an alumni, I'm a staff employee, I live on the county on the edge, and uh, most people are affectionate about the school and the sports teams and the people that are there. We um, want the best for it, and hopefully the university wants the best for the town that it's located in. Um, they're a state agency. That's a fact. We have no legal, compelling argument to make them do anything. Our, our codes are not enforced on their campus. Um, it's just a fact. Um, we do partner in some things, sanitary, power, water, the 911 authority building that we're working on right now, all these are good things. We partner when it's in tech's interest to partner. That's a fact. Um, regarding the meals tax, tech should collect it and they should remit it to the town. But we cannot compel them to do that. That's a fact. Right now, here's where the issue stands. Tech tried to make an argument that they could find no way to collect that tax. And we based, and that in fact the law prohibited them from doing so. Uh, our response essentially was not true. And we pointed out Virginia code that basically um, points that out very clearly. We haven't heard from them. And that's essentially where it's going to stand. The council are not going to be able to convince them to do this. Where this issue is going to be won is in the court of public opinion in the letter writing campaign across the state and all the major cities where there are alumni, parents who send their kids here, and powerful people who are donors and, and are important to Virginia Tech for them to say, you should do this. We won on the Boston concessions of the athletics. And I suspect soon we may win on the, the hotel and conference center. Tech's mission has changed over the years. Now they have huge dining apparatuses and huge things in town. Before, we used to have a symbiotic relationship in terms of where the students were and what our downtown businesses offered them. Now Tech is basically arguing that, you know, you have everything here on campus that you need. You don't need to go to town. That's a, that's a true change in relationship. And that, that is a threat to the town and to our businesses. And, um, but I'm sorry, there's really not a lot we can do except continue to remind them that they should be better neighbors. Um, I, I feel that the town's relationship to the university is uh, perhaps a little more complicated than the question portrays. Uh, the question was, again was, you know, we're in a symbiotic relationship, what can, what can town council itself do to make that better? It's a reasonable enough question, but um, it's just a, a really big, um, big topic. Um, and and I, I want to say I do think that it would be um, a mistake to allow the meals tax to define the entirety of our connection with that university. Um, Michael did a, a splendid job of outlining the, the uh, I think the critical features of where we are with that tax and how we differ from other communities. And I know he's put in many hours of work uh, to you know, uh, create leaflets, to educate the general public, to take the issue to um, staff members on, on campus. Uh, so um, at considerable personal expense, he has done a lot of work to advance this issue, uh, as some of the others of us. And uh, so I don't think that there's any disagreement among us about whether or not should be collecting those taxes and 
certainly the, the slam dunk should be that uh, there's even a mechanism already written into the contract with the uh, third party contractor at the end of Virginia Tech. They could do it tomorrow if they just asked them to begin collecting lodgings debt. So, um, but you know, if, if you look at it in a bigger picture, um, I think it's true, John, that, you know, they do what they want. And uh, we live uh, in a town that is a company town, so to speak. It had its boom in the 60s and then cons considerably more growth through the uh, 90s uh, and in, uh, in this uh, century. And, um, but there are, there are indications besides the meals tax that um, an old guard on Tech's campus uh, just still has that iron grip and a sense that they shouldn't be messed with. There was this hokey real estate case that took place recently uh, that was settled, um, but I think unsatisfactorily in some ways. There was the announcement in April that Virginia Tech will appeal $55,000 in federal fines that were levied by the U.S. Department of Education. I mean, that just looks mean spirited. Um, there's the refusal to collect, the amount to pay, but simply to collect the taxes at the end. And then there's this last um, electric franchise that you mentioned. And, um, <coughs> just think they're not thinking seriously enough about how that plays. Well, that's that's the prepared questions we have. We can't, because you guys actually were very disciplined and moved along really well. We have about 10 minutes here. Um, and we thought this might happen, but we didn't believe it. But we, we have a plan. And, and we, 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 we ask for a question or two from the audience, and we'll give you each a minute to respond to, to that question. And so that means somebody has to have a question right ready to go. Okay, Phyllis, you, you jumped. <laughs> and I don't know which event I got to, but my, my biggest question is about a public swimming, swimming pool. It's very personal to me because my kids grew up going to the one on top of the hill at the golf course. And nobody in the neighborhood knew it was coming down. It just came down. And when I talked to the director of recreation about, oh, Phyllis, we're going to build a new one. Don't worry. I am very concerned that a large portion of our population does not have access to a public swimming pool. I know it's expensive, but how it was taken down, how nobody knew about it was incredible to me. And there are many people in our community that do have access to outdoor public swimming pool, but there are many who don't. The ones who do are very blessed, but the rest of us, um, my kids, we couldn't have afforded Country yeah. Club and, uh, and a list. Can we get some quick responses here? I've got the chart. And I'll tell you, I'll have to admit to you, Phyllis, you asked me this in the last election, and I thought, where is that coming from? <laughs> because I haven't heard anybody say it before, but apparently uh, you have now swayed um, 24, well, 24% of the households that responded <coughs> to this survey on parks and rec facilities said that some flavor of like intensely important or mildly important, but 24% said out, an outdoor, specifically an outdoor swimming pool would be important. A larger number are interested in expanding or improving, uh, well it says a new, wait a second, uh, expand the existing indoor aquatic center. There was 38% of people who were intensely, like strongly supportive of that idea. But, um, so, uh, they, the figures I hear is that they're extremely costly to build. They're only open part of the year. And um, if you were gonna put more money in the pools, I'm thinking it might be the more, the, the more frugal thing to do to expand on the, um, next. I'll go ahead and, and, and add to that. Uh, that was part of the, uh, the uh, Parks and Rec uh, study, uh, which came down to an indoor multi-generational multi-purpose rec center, which could include an indoor pool. But uh, I just can't see uh, the money for an outdoor pool. Phyllis, I know it's one of your dreams. Uh, if you win the lottery, let us know. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think in terms of the, the mission of Parks and Rec and in terms of what the town has available that, that uh, can be the, uh, something that we spend money on in the near future. Um, I know that uh, pools are obviously expensive. We, we, we don't, I don't think we make any money on our, our indoor pool. I know
know, Christiansburg has had some problems making money on its indoor facility. Um, and I, I go there for my therapy school because it's got a nice 96 degree warm pool <coughs> therapy. Uh, but I get, and as, as Leslie said, I don't think that's where the citizens see a priority right now with what little money we have. I will start off saying it is good to get a surprise question that isn't about Walmart, chickens, or mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I never actually received a, a full question. I actually don't have the data in front of me about um, like finances for pools and that sort of thing. Less is kind of hiding over there. Um, um, but I, I will say it's something you would have to look at the numbers and the finances. I think that there might be opportunities to partner with Christian Sporting Aquatic Center. Um, like uh, Paul mentioned, and we um, possibly expand indoor facilities, but I don't know um, whether there's the same type of opportunities for outdoor um, pools. Um, but I haven't, I haven't done much uh, research on that. Yeah. Phyllis, I like outdoor pools. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, you know, I grew up uh, swim team, doing swim team activities and associated often with you know, neighborhood and, and city um, functions. I do think it's mostly a a, uh, activity of a bygone generation. I don't think we're going to see that happen for the reasons that people have said here. Um, could, could you have a pool that opens up and expands and has outdoor activity from the inside to outside? Yes, I think we could probably do something like that. Uh, I think we need to, to look at that. It's probably not an either or situation, but I think the model of the old outdoor pool that's just an outdoor pool and you go and you have a life card sitting around and the girls walking around the concession stand and all that. And I think that model is that model. Is that model. And, and we'll have to come up with a new way of having that outdoor experience with the indoor, especially, you know, outdoor pools are mostly for young people. Indoor pools are largely for, um, you know, uh, people as they, as they get older. And um, I think what we, what we have from the Parks and Rec plan is, a, as I said, a multi-generational uh, facility that we hope to um, speak more about sometime in the near future. Anybody else? Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. My question is, how can we get more, <coughs> excuse me, low and mid-level cost uh, housing for, for people who cannot afford the Blacksburg prices, rental, just speaking specifically of rental housing? Well, get back to build more dorms, that would reduce the, the cost of housing generally in the area, especially for rental. Um, I think, uh, we have been trying to do what we can with the uh, small amount of uh, community development block grant money that we, we do. We split that uh, between uh, affordable housing projects, usually small projects a few at a time. Uh, also to the uh, Women's Center to help uh, prevent homelessness among women and their children when they have a domestic situation. And also to uh, provide affordable daycare. Because if you are working poor and you have kids, the daycares can cost as much as you make. Uh, so that's how we uh, initially decided to divvy up the CDPG money. Um, beyond that, I think uh, I think we, can, we need to look at pocket places to, to maybe we can put some houses here and there. I would like to uh, uh, think we could just uh, come up with a way to make developers put a percentage of their housing into uh, uh, affordable housing, but that's, that's a very complicated issue. I'm for it, but who knows? Well, you're certainly right that we need more affordable housing um, in Blacksburg. I don't have the, the numbers of the most recent ones, but uh, two years ago, the average cost of a home um, in Blacksburg was about $186,000, uh, which is about fifteen dollars to $20,000 more than the whole cost of a home in Christiansburg, uh, even more than the cost of homes in the county that wasn't part of just Christiansburg and Blacksburg. So, Certainly, we need more opportunities um, to encourage home ownership between uh, low to moderate income people. The Community Development Block Grant Program, as we mentioned um, uh, several times, and uh, Paul outlined how the, uh, the money is used. Um, in the, the past, um, a lot of the affordable housing types of things have dealt with infill development. I think we need to continue to focus on infill development and creating more opportunities, grant opportunities, uh, so that uh, people under the uh, HUD's definition of affordable housing, which is um, housing doesn't take up more than 30% of the median income in the community, um, that, that those people are able to um, uh, own a home and uh, be valuable for that community. 
we, we have made some progress. Um, the CDBG grants, teaming up with community housing partners to build um, some um, houses in my neighborhood and in the Bennett Hill Progress Street neighborhood um, has really made a difference and they've been great projects. Um, we hope that we can do some of that, uh, maybe even a significant amount on the old middle school site. Um, that's something that we're going to pursue um, very vigorously. I'm uh, hoping the town can be a partner in that. Uh, I think that's a good site for that. Having people that work downtown, live downtown, use the buses, all the transportation, the congestion, the bike lanes um, is, is what we want to see. Uh, we're, 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 a, we're a prosperous town. When I moved in to Wharton Street, there were uh, several um, uh, trailer parks right around where I live. They're all gone now. There are currently a bunch of them that I know of on, on Gibbons Lane in that area. I think the development is expanding the Given Street, uh, Progress Street through there, will mean that those will be too. In some ways that's unfortunate. And I'm not, I don't know exactly how to think about that, how we force out uh, that type of living conditions with new development and, and new uh, houses. But we do need to pursue that vigorously. We do need to make sure that we offer alternative um, living conditions. Um. I, I won't say exactly who this was, but I had a, a county supervisor one time say to me, oh, Leslie, you know, is uh, just going to become a, a sort of privileged enclave. You can just, you know, this is how it's going to be. You're going to be Boulder, Colorado. You might as well put gates up around it. And that's how that's going to be. And it, it just really caught me off guard. And the more I've had a chance to think it over, the more I understand why that individual could make the case. Um, but uh, if we can do something to prevent that, LMI housing is one of those things. And we have done it very artfully, um, the slow and moderate income housing. Um, we do leverage our, our CDBG funds artfully. Uh, we have tried all kinds of different models. We bought a house on Gross Drive at one point and kind of flipped it. Not that we want to be in the business of flipping houses, but that we have done that. <coughs> we have an emergency home repair program. We have done beautiful uh, low income housing up along Lee Street, which I think you're referencing. And, um, but I think, you know, uh, and, and we could plant uh, LMI housing in, uh, in strategic ways. As I mentioned before, we could try to work on Roanoke Street so that it's high profile, high visibility, and can bring along other pieces of uh, the neighborhood. But um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the guideline to get into, uh, the state guideline to get into LMI housing is 60% of um, the median income. And I think uh, the federal guideline is 80% of the median income. But in, in our town, I've got a couple of friends in Cedar uh, Hill subdivision. One of them is a nail technician, and the other one is a school librarian. Okay, so we're talking about productive, middle class, frequently college educated people who can't afford a house in Blacksburg. And that should alarm most of us, I think. Um, but one last thing I want to say about this is uh, one thing that we could do to help address the uh, bizarre housing market that we have is to work on this over occupancy issue. When, when owners can take a house that they've inherited and is completely paid for and then stuff it with four to five students. That makes the cost of rents go up for everybody. And so that's a different piece of it that doesn't address federal funding at all. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to go to uh, our last uh, round uh, uh, lined up comments from each of you. Uh, two minutes each. And I think we're around at the Michael beginning. Um, tonight, each of us has answered a number of important questions. We've addressed things ranging from how the town's going to deal with properties um, uh, working with the county and the town uh, to problem properties on town and dealing with over occupancy things. We dealt with uh, the bike and pedestrian master plan, downtown revitalization, relationships with Virginia Tech, uh, swimming pools, and affordable housing. Um, by now, you should have a better understanding of each of our vision, our values, and our priorities in the town of Blacksburg. All of our answers tonight have in many ways have respond to one much more fundamental question. A question that I'm also asked, all been asked while campaigning. Why are you running for Blackstone Town Council? This may seem like a simple question, but in many ways it is not. 
I'm running because I believe economic development, regional cooperation, smart growth, and strong neighborhoods are critical to Blacksburg's future. Between the North Main Street improvements and the Old Blacksburg Middle School redevelopment, between new school construction and broadband expansion, <coughs> and the time of change and opportunity in Blacksburg. I'm running because I want to help address the many challenges that our community faces as well. Yesterday, Easy Chair Coffee Shop University Mall, a staple in our community, shuttered its doors, and in two weeks, Barnes and Noble the first remain to follow suit. I want Blacksburg to not only grow and prosper, but also maintain our high standard of living. I'm running because I want to listen and respond to the needs of all Blacksburg residents, regardless of their age, income level, or station in life, because I want locals to understand the enormous talent and creativity of college students and students to understand the real impact they have on the community at large. And last but not least, I'm running, I'm running because I want to bring new ideas and a fresh perspective to the community I've called home the past nine years. I do offer a unique voice to local issues, and my record of service shows that I'm able to put words into action. I would appreciate your support and your vote in November. I look forward to meet, meeting each of you after tonight's event and on the campaign trail. And once again, I thank you for coming out on a Wednesday night uh, to learn about the candidates and the issues in the upcoming election. <coughs> I'm running for town council for my second term. Uh, I need your help. I need your assistance. I look for your ideas and I look for your support. We still have a lot of work to do. We've made some good start in the last couple of years. I think this last election two years ago really helped set us on a good path. Um, I want to continue that work. There's still some critical decisions that need to be made as we implement a concept plan for the old middle school property. I hope to be integral to that. I think my planning background, architectural knowledge of how developers and plans are read, and my ability to communicate that, both to my colleagues as well as staff and citizens, will be an important ingredient in that. Uh, the town, downtown and town gown issues are uh, absolutely vital to me, and I think to many of us. Um, that's, a, that's something I know will need continued vigilance and some expertise in, and knowledge of that area and the issues that are down there. I think I have that. There are other areas that we're going to need to, to expand on, whether it's uh, the development community, commercial business, and the reconciliation of those interests between the towns and neighborhoods and uh, business community. I think we're on the right path, and I think um, this council deserves your support. And I hope that my part of that uh, will also be in your mind when you go to the voting booth on November 8th. I'd like to echo your, your remarks about how, uh, how well I think that this council works together and, uh, with each other and also with town staff. Um, but uh, I, and I, I guess what I'd like to do is, because it came up in two or three different contexts, I'd like to use a minute and a half of uh, my time to come back to this neighborhood enforcement, code enforcement issues, uh, things that we can do to encourage more civility, in our town, more civility in our neighborhoods. Um, this is an example of how I think uh, we have been grappling with really tricky issues. We, we have pressed it and pressed it and we had a report out after a summer of study on the part of town staff. We were given a very comprehensive report out uh, by members of the planning staff, the chief of police, and also in our housing and community development offices. And so I want to recap some of the things that they said. Um, uh, from the people who are in charge of zoning enforcement, uh, they have been going out actually at night, and we're talking about two people, okay, again, to get to that point about what a small staff we have. They have been going out at nighttime and on weekends looking for um, indications that a house is over-occupied. It's very difficult, uh, it's very difficult to get um, uh, substantiating information. As, as one member of staff told me one time, you, you can't take a cheap swab. You know, and if they tell you they're cousins, then that's difficult. But anyway, this is being done. Um, in addition, uh, Chief Grannis reports that bike patrols uh, are going to be going into certain targeted uh, neighborhoods more often. Um, they'll be working on noise, alcohol, and drunken public um, uh, complaints. Uh, in addition, there are going to be more code enforcement patrols. That's David Darnell on his uh, bicycle. In the downtown east side, the Bennett Hill Progress, the Cabrich Crescent, and the McBride neighborhoods. Okay, so targeted uh, activity in these neighborhoods. 
even establish and uh, co-advise the off-campus Greek Housing Council, a partnership with BT to establish an active dialogue of fraternities. Uh, there's going to be a coordinated, updated website for the town of Blacksburg and the Virginia Tech so that there is a comprehensive educational program going on with students. Um, the Student Government Association is going to be contacted uh, to raise awareness at their fall meetings. They are coordinating a proactive marketing campaign that's going to include dining carts on the table, which probably works better than most things, BT bus ads with inside of the buses, an article on the parents' newsletter, which I think will be helpful, letter to the editor's uh, series, and a collegiate living article in the Collegiate Times. Um, so uh, th this, just to explain, the, the, you know, quite a lot is being done. It's been um, the effort of many months of council working together to try to make it clear that this is a priority. Uh, and I guess the last thing I will say is if you will visit my website, WesleyNeagerSmith.com, my voting record is there, my bio is there, endorsements are there, volunteer opportunities, uh, <laughs> and uh, a blog. So please, please visit that and you'll learn more. Well, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Citizens First for this forum. I think it's a good opportunity to find out that at least among these four people, I think you've got people who are all dedicated to making Blacksburg a better place in the way. Um, as I said in the beginning, uh, uh, there were a lot of things we did when I was on council before that are finally taking shape now, and I'd like to be back on council to take part in the next generation of those kinds of big changes, like the North Main Project and then uh, Progress Street Extension and, and College Avenue and uh, uh, the uh, Blacksburg Motor Company. But I also like the minutia of, uh, of being on, on uh, council. Uh, as I've said, this is my third comprehensive plan, and if you want minutia, that's the place to go. <laughs> um, I worked on the uh, Environmental Management Advisory Board. I was the council rep. Uh, that's a group that looks at all the departments of the town and, and tries to pick out from the hundreds of ideas the top 12 or 15 that we should work on in ter terms of making Blacksburg a better place in terms of the town to do. Uh, uh, housing, all its uh, hazardous waste in one place, building, uh, building specifically for that was one example of things we did. The downtown bike racks, just grabbing Steve Ross one day and saying, let's take a walk downtown. Here's where we can move this one, we could add one here. Simple things that uh, we, we could do. Uh, adding uh, sustainable beautification to the Civic Beautification Awards. That was an idea that I gave to, to the uh, Beautification Committee. I think we need more green. I think we need a tree policy. I think people who top their trees, I don't believe in the death penalty, but <laughs> uh, we need to get more Modea type operations downtown. We've got, we've got the areas set aside for the shops to come in and for the uh, for people to live, we need to bring the people downtown to be working there, and then to live there, and then to eat there, and uh, then to buy their whatever there. Uh, I still think we need the referendum on raising uh, taxes to complete the bikeway pedestrian master plan and the new rec center, and then there's the meal tax. Thank you. Well, um, that's uh, that's the whole round here. Uh, I, I, I have to commend you all for your patience and um, we will in, in all of this. I think we've, we've had an opportunity to learn a few new uh, pieces of information, get a better insight into the individuals that are running this uh, this fall for town council. Um, it's Citizens First um, for Blacksburg, uh, dot org. Um, you can uh, get our emails from there and uh, send us what you think what you think the issues are, what uh, the priorities or candidates you, you feel that, that Citizens First should be uh, supporting. No one um, wants to carry any yard signs home. <laughs> yeah. And uh, each of the candidates has, has provided um, paraphernalia for you to be with. <laughs> <laughs>
Bruce.